This is the Comics Alternative Euro Comics. Reviews of Notes Season 1 and California Dreamin' Cass Elliot Before the Mamas and the Papas. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Euro Comics. I'm Derek. And I'm Edward. And we're two guys with advanced degrees who love talking about comics. That's right. And on the April Euro Comics episode, Edward and I are going to be looking at two recent publications. We're going to begin with the first volume of Boulet's Notes. And then after that, we're going to take a look at Penelope Bagieu's California Dreaming, Cass Elliot, Before the Mamas and the Papas. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Euro Comics is brought to you by the fine folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC... Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes it could be 50% off cover, but every now and again you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. That's right. Right now, you can get one of the books, very books we're going to be discussing this episode, Penelope Bajieu's California Dreamin' for 30% off. Now, this is a, a handsome hardcover edition from First Second. They don't do it that often. And it's $17.49 uh, at 30% off. That And this is really a stunning book. Absolutely stunning. Or, or you can get Bajieu's uh, English language debut, which... Uh, a first second put out a few years ago, Exquisite Corpse. Mm-hmm. And that's also 30% off right now. You can also check out the other creator we'll be discussing this week, Boulet. Uh, he's one of a number uh, of all-star creators in The Tipping Point, an anthology from Humanoids. That's also 30% off. Now, this is an incredible all-star lineup. It's, we're talking Boulet, Eddie Campbell, John Cassidy, Bob Fingerman, uh, uh Frederick Peters, Paul Pope, uh, Anki Bilal, and you know it's it's a it's a it's a huge book, uh, and it's at thirty percent off, only twenty one dollars. That's right. You got great deals every single month at Discount Comic Book Service on European comics and otherwise. Go to dcbservice.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Edward and Derek sent you. Well, Edward, before we get to this month's discussion, we should share with our listeners some email that we received a few weeks ago. Yeah, this is some really exciting uh, e- anim- uh, news, and I'm really glad that the email seems to be picking up. But with you know the letter from uh, uh, Jerome last time, and um, and then this time, time it's another creator. Right uh, now, a few months ago, uh, and listeners may remember Edward, you and I did an episode where we were looking specifically at Spanish comics in translation, and we looked at a number of Fantagraphics publications. It was almost like uh, you know the invasion of the Spanish comics creators, and one of the creators that we discussed was Ezequiel Garcia. He is the author of Growing Up in Public. Well, back toward the end of March, he sent us an email on March 21st, and he said, Hi, guys. How are you? My name is Ezequiel Garcia. I'm a cartoonist from Argentina. Last year, I published Growing Up in Public through Fantagraphics, and I heard a beautiful review you did in your Eurocomics podcast. Thanks a lot for that. And then he goes on to say that he's arriving that day in Seattle. He'll be doing a presentation there, and he's doing one a few days later at Desert Island, uh, the shop in Brooklyn. And he says, if you're based on one of those cities, please, you're welcome to come. 
And if you have a possibility to publicize this event, I'd be very grateful, which we actually did in a previous show. Thanks a lot. Keep in touch. Bye. Ezekiel. And uh, yeah, he, he was one of the – in fact, uh, Growing Up in Public uh, was one of the two books from that uh, Spanish language uh, episode that were from Argentina. Yeah, um, uh, and uh, we've continued to to cover some of the creators that we first encountered in the episode like Paco Roca um, with The Lighthouse in, in last week's episode. So we want to thank Ezekiel for getting in touch with us, and we hope you had a great stay in this country, uh, both in Seattle and in New York. And please get back in touch with us about your future work. Yeah, please do. We'd love to. We'd love to. We'd love to hear from everyone: uh, fans, creators, readers, um, other translators, translators cr- yeah. uh, critics. You know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been especially rewarding knowing that creators are listening and that they, you know, appreciate uh, the coverage. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, on the topic of translators, which you were one, Edward, as a professional, uh, I think you have a little news to share, don't you? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, there's there's, there's a, a couple interesting things have uh, have have happened to me lately. So it's funny. Uh, um, uh, well, first up, I just wanted to say also. Um, you know, uh, uh, from uh, last just this past week, uh, I, I wasn't able to attend, but um, Blutch was on tour in in New York briefly. He did a number of um, events. Uh, he was at the Mocha Arts Festival. He was at Desert Island Comics in Brooklyn. He spoke, um, you know, at Parsons School of Design, and he spoke at Albertine uh, Books, which is the bookstore of the French M- French Consulate in New York, located in the French Consulate's really beautiful. Um, uh, Belle Epoque building uh, up on uh, fi- uh, Fifth Avenue across from Central Park, and there um, Blutch spoke with Richard McGuire, uh, and and uh, and then later at the at Columbia University's Maison Française, he spoke with Charles Burns uh, and uh, uh, and Françoise Mouly, uh, Art Spiegelman's wife and and the art director of the New Yorker. Um, so. Uh, uh, I hope people were able to attend some of those events. Uh, any listeners in New York, I'd love to hear more about them. Um, uh, I, um, I I had a lot of fun working on Peplum. I'll be doing another book with New York Review Comics uh, this summer. Uh, I, I think it's not due out till till late fall though. And um, and I I did another Blutch book recently, digital only, but uh, it's a uh, Dark Side of the Moon. It's kind of a, a dystopian science fiction satire about making comics uh it's very blutch and so um, that can be found on online at itunes and the uh, usual uh locations through through the digital only europe comics publisher so i i really would love to hear more about these blutch events I, i'm one of the things i'm expecting the mail looking forward to is i hear blutch stop by the new york review comics office and um did these elaborate sketches in a lot of the books uh as you know gifts to the the uh, staff so um i'll be looking forward to my my dedicated um, my personally dedicated version of a uh, of uh, edition of a peplum and Great. so speak yeah that's it's that's uh, really exciting and um speaking of albertine the french uh consulate's bookstore uh albertine is sponsoring um uh a prize uh, for the it's it's inaugural year, year for this prize. It's called the Albertine Prize. Uh, it's a Reader's Choice Award for the best contemporary French fiction in English translation, and it's co-presented by the Cultural Services of the French Embassy and Van Cleef and Arpels. And uh, I, I'm one uh, one of the books that I translated, um, uh, "Naked" by the Belgian author Jean Philippe Toussaint. Is up. It's one of ten books that are shortlisted for this prize, and um, it's uh, Jean Philippe Toussaint is is you know it's a, he's a major um, uh, contemporary Belgian no- uh, novelist. He's a little like Nicholson Baker, maybe he's kind of like a someone who's really obsessed with the recording the minutia of uh, everyday life mm-hmm. and and feelings uh, on a really micro level, and. Um, this is uh, he, almost all his books have been translated into English now, but several different translators. And this is the second book of his I've translated after a collection of essays that came out a few years ago. And um, this is the last book in a tr- in a 
tetralogy he did about someone um, that, uh, that revolves around the figure of uh, the, the, uh, of Marie, uh, a fashion designer and um, love interest for the narrator. Uh, and you don't have to have read the others to read this last book. It, you know, it's completely standalone. But um, yeah, um, there's two rounds of voting, and the first round of voting ends on the 15th. And you can only vote of April, of April, of April, right. and you this can month. only yeah this month. And then after that, there'll only be three out of the ten uh, nominees left. So I, you know, I'm trying to put the the word out there to please vote. If you like any of the other novels you see, you vote for them as well because you can vote for more than one novel. That's and one where of the would great people go to vote? Prize. Well, uh, it's at www.albertine.com uh, slash Albertine dash prize but the easiest thing is just to google albertine prize and you should come across it albertine is albert a l b e r t i n e albertine and uh, the albertine prize yeah um it's a uh, uh, please uh you can only vote from a us ip address <laughs> so um <laughs> uh sorry international listeners but um yeah uh it i Votes would be much appreciated. Well, congratulations on being nominated, Edward. And when this sh- when this episode goes up, listeners will have, I think, one or two days to 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 do that before the fifteenth. If it ends on the fifteenth, so in fact, as you're listening to this episode, you may want to get to a computer and pull up that website and vote. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jean Philippe Toussaint, the author. Thanks you too. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the first title that we will be discussing for this month, and this is the first volume of Boulet's Notes. This one is subtitled Born to be a Larve, and it's published in the U.S., or at least in English, from Soaring Penguin Press, because I believe Soaring Penguin is a U.K. publisher, correct? Yeah, I think so too, yes. Yeah, and uh, I guess there are going to be more volumes to come. This one covers his... Um, I guess we can call this diary comics that he first published on his blog between, what, July 2004 and uh, into 2005, July 2005. Yeah, yeah, I should say that, you know, just as a historical interjection here, um, uh, both of the creators we're covering this week, one thing they have in common, besides being relatively new and of the young up and uh, the, the successful young generation, uh, the current young generation, is also that they both got their start and both first came to fame um, through their comics blogs. And that comics blogging, just about the little things of daily life, was uh, – for some reason it was much more popular in France that like US web comics seemed to, to evolve toward strips and or narrative – but that comics, uh, web comics in France, the first major way they developed was um, these kind of diary memoir comics. Mm-hmm. Now, there, you know, there are a lot of U.S. creators who have web comics who do the, exactly what Boulet is doing, where you have oh, sure, a, sure. Da- a, you know daily diary strips. Um, so it, it, it's not uncommon here. But I think you're right to point out that if this is how French web comics or you know, comics on a blog, because comics on a blog is, in essence, the same thing as a webcomic, um, that if this is what really began in France as, as as popular, then that does give some context to how I think we should approach Notes, this first volume, um, because, I mean, it, it, we can talk about this as we get into our discussion, but I had to, in some ways, kind of adjust myself in terms of reader expectations uh, within the first several pages in order to get into what Boulet is doing with this book. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I, I think there, it is funny because he, um, he, uh, he, he, he contextualizes it. He, it, it. There's almost like a meta – oh, there, there's, a, there's a meta frame to the book uh, that, that – um, uh, since the book is already about you know his daily life, the meta frame is about – 
uh, what is what does it mean to take these strips of daily life to exhume them from uh, uh, being buried in hard drives or or a portfolio, um, scattered sketches and files, and assemble them for a book, and right. that's what gives the frame that gives a, a frame, uh, not just beginning and ending, but you know a couple times throughout as well, uh, a frame where he seems to be talking to his current girlfriend slash wife, um, uh, a. a discussing uh what who, uh his fears and hopes and feelings about um assembling a collection of uh comics uh web comics that uh, and uh comics blogs uh stuff that he began kind of on a whim and didn't really ex- uh to uh, a whim to find uh, to find a place to express himself in ways that his professional assignments weren't allowing him to. Exactly. Now you mentioned that in these frames that we get, these bits that kind of contextualize what he's doing, right? In some ways, meta commentary on the very act of putting a web comic into print form. Uh, you mentioned that this is his significant other. Now, do do we know who she is? Does, in other words, is she given a name? Not that I remember, but but I but I I guess I only say that because whenever uh, th- there are the, a lot of these comics are more or less chronological, right? And there are a lot of comics where he seems to be single, and then th- but he seems to be whenever he cuts to this uh, scenes with this uh, woman, they seem to be cohabiting. So either they're just good friends, and he he has referred to flatmates throughout, mm-hmm. or they're you know that could be a. Um, or there are a couple – that could be an erroneous assumption on my part. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons why I ask is because we see her throughout this book, right? And, and in fact, there's a particular art style that distinguishes these moments in the text where I guess we can call them the, the contemporary framing moments where he and this woman are discussing the project itself, right? What it's right. like, common – uh, what it was like to to put it from let's say web to book form, um, maybe even commenting on the various strips themselves, and so she she has a a a prominent role throughout the book, but but the art style is distinctive. So it's in black and white. I think rather detailed art compared to some of his his web strips. Um, and there are splashes of bright orange for his hair. That are throughout. Now you see his his orange reddish, I guess, hair in the other strips that are reproduced. But I think that the color of his hair is most striking in these more contemporary uh, frame pieces because it's, it's black color. and white. Yes, except for 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 the orange. So you can tell when we go from let's say the previously published web comic strips to something that is specifically for this book. And give some kind of context and even commentary about the various web strips. Um, and I'm a little surprised that he didn't name her because she appears so frequently. And maybe he did, but I'm just forgetting. But it could be a significant other. It could be a flatmate. We don't know. But she's used um, in many ways, I guess, as a narrative device in order to sound off a foil, on yeah. what's going on. And yes, it'll, it'll, it allows a kind of commentary that – if it was just him by himself addressing us as readers about what he's doing, it would have come off, I think, a little more awkward. Yeah. No. I mean, I mean, uh, she's there to answer, uh, ask questions, raise objections. You know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and and I just to know on the art too. I think one of the effects of this collection, I mean, it only covers a year, but it's the first year. Also, it is is uh, the art is tremendously varied. Uh, most of these. Um, uh, we're looking mostly at you know episodes, with some exceptions. We're looking at like one to four or five page strips, right, uh, mm-hmm. or, or or stories. But the art is tremendously varied. But it does seem to get there's sort of a general trend toward greater complexity or uh, elaborateness as the book goes on. I don't think that's so much that we're watching an artist evolve or quote unquote get better, but we're just maybe seeing as an index of how much effort he's. Uh, how how much more the blog is ab- absorbing him? You know, like uh, how much more he's putting into it. Uh, there is a marked, I think, crudeness to the earlier, uh, mostly travel log, um, blog stuff, uh, coverage of 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 professional trips to to professional events. Um, so that may be some of the chunkiness you're talking about. You had to, you said something about readjusting your expectations when you first opened the book because the book opens with the. Very, fairly concrete 
um, black and white, orange spotted style to, for, of the meta, uh, of the framing, uh, and, uh, uh, and then immediately goes to the earliest blog entries, which are, are pretty rough, and also have a much uh, often tend to cram a lot of tiny panels onto onto the page. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should also note that the uh, English version is, um, I would say, about. Seventy-five percent larger than the French paper, uh, French version, so it's even tinier in the French. Because you had the original French, right? Oh, I have both. Uh, uh, thanks to Soaring Penguin, um, they, who generously gave us review copies. But yeah, I have both for purposes of comparison. Okay, uh, and we should mention maybe at this point that if our listeners want to see uh, Boulet's blog, you know, in its original form, right? And he's still. Uh, posting, uh, they should go to bouletcore.com. That's one word, B-O-U-L-E-T-C-O-R-P.com. And there is a French original version, of course, uh, but you can also read his blog in English and Korean. Yeah, um, so um, I do... Uh, I do want to. Uh, I do. I absolutely second that. I do want to definitely encourage that. And I want to say that I know that Derek, you and I both have our reservation, various reservations about this book, in, in in different ways. But I absolutely, wholeheartedly, and uh, just completely, uh, fervently, even uh, <laughs> urge readers to go check out his blog because I do think. I do think. Boulet is is a tremendous talent. I think he's he, he there's an effortless naturalness to his cartooning that uh I find just really entrancing. I I've been aware of Boulet for quite some time. Um I uh he um I have other volumes in French of his um his uh, collected blogs and uh, one of the most interesting things he's doing right now on the blog is is um uh he um he's um uh, he or, or not right now, but for a little while now, um, he he's been doing this um, uh, stuff where he he does digital only stuff. What I mean is that like he does little, he adds little motion to uh, and lighting changes and stuff to certain panels of his comic, uh, of his web comic, and so that can't be rep- rep- reproduced in the in the in the paper versions. But you know, there's one really touching one he does about remembering what it's like to be a kid in the back seat of his parents' car and the, having the light from the street lights wash over him and it's a little repetitive lighting effect that goes just over one panel and it's really beautiful and it really works and like Boulet seems to have this really instinctive canny sense for for timing and for what will just work in in a comic and uh, it serves him and his humor, his casual sort of sloppy humor, really, really well. So I do think Boulet is a very interesting creator. Like I think the first time I saw his work was he did he has a famous sketch of a zombie uh, Smurfette that's really funny. But uh, but like so I do, and also his uh, another one I got a later volume of notes I think has his completely silent um um uh, ver- uh, uh attempts at the twenty Scott McCloud's twenty four hour comics. Mm-hmm. And, and I think his his entries in that are really strong. So um, do do please do check him out as a creator. I, I really right. think that's yeah yeah. Now you you mentioned a second ago that both of us have s- some issues. Let's just say with this book notes uh, the first volume. Uh, to put some context, you know, you and I were talking before we turned on the mic about you know which book would we discuss first on this month's episode, and so we were starting to talk about notes and how each of us thought about it, and um, so so yeah, that's what you were referring to. Now, my reservation, let's say, with this first volume of Boulet's notes is linked to its genesis as a blog. Um. I think that – and this also gets back to what I was saying earlier about having to adjust my expectations within the first several pages. It's like, oh, OK. This is the kind of book that that I'm going to be reading now. Um, there are some web comics that I think translate really well to print format, and then there are others that may suffer in print – not that it's something that doesn't look good in print, but the kind of stories that they're telling, the kind of narrative, whether it be something that is diary-like as we have with Boulet's work or an ongoing storyline, um, if it's something that 
over, a, let's say, a relatively contained period of time, it reads kind of clunky and repetitive. Then it usually, then for me, it's something that is much better to remain on the web than in print form. There are a lot of web comics that come out what once, twice, sometimes three times a week, and readers only get this web comic occasionally whenever it's updated, right? So yeah. if it's updated twice a week, then they get two shots per week. Then they have to wait to the next week. There are a couple of more pages, so on and so forth. And so I think the pacing of your reading feeds into your expectations of what you're taking away from the experience. Yeah, it's funny, Derek, to, to put this in, uh, not not to be condescending and put this in terms millennials would understand, but it's funny, when I listen to you, it sounds like what you're describing is television that's made for binging versus television that's uh, all, all in, in the old episodic model. Exactly, and I think, that, I think that that's a great analogy, because there's some web comics that if you read them in one sitting or a relatively con contained period of time, they just don't have the same feel to them, right? So there are certain... Uh, strategies or tropes that seem to be clunky because it's repetitive or the style of storytelling, which is maybe better suited to come out once or twice a week, doesn't really work the same way when you have a narrative that you take in all at once, so to speak. And, and I think that that was the experience in my reading of Boulay's notes, this first volume. Now, the one thing that tempered that, I guess, uh, from, from everything I've said, is that qualifying narrative frame, right, where he and he, this, this woman who – we don't know who she is – where he's talking about the experience of going from webcomic to print, should he do it or not, and then commenting on the various strips every now and again. So I think that for me, that saved this book and made it much more readable in, let's say, a long, a, a shorter setting than if I would have read these things, the original webcomic strips, as they were coming out between July of 2004 and July of 2005. Well, that's interesting because I, I do think that the, so so the in the beginning we will, I mean not not to get into all the the little um, uh, commentary he scatters throughout, but in the beginning and the end strip he brings up two syndromes that he has made up right that he is right. afraid will afflict his uh, afflict this collection, uh, and and the first uh, is. Um, the he Frankenstein, calls Frankenstein syndrome. syndrome because he's afraid that it's not it's not this isn't a, a book that's been conceived as a whole in some organic natural way it's a book that's assembled from all these spare parts so it'll look mm -hmm. hideous and misshapen and then his second one is the what they translate as the colleague but probably the coworker syndrome might be a little more natural I don't know maybe UK English is different but um but it's it's that it you might just get sick of him because it'll sound like the one funny coworker. This is basically what you said already, Derek. But but in his version, it's there's the one funny coworker who always wants to tell you a joke, and he's hanging out by the water cooler, and you know you can put up with a joke from him every few days. But if he pins you there and just goes gives you joke after joke after joke, then you start to you know, uh, you, you're not able to stand him. You know, and right, so, exactly. So it, it does seem that Boulet is very aware of these. But I have to say that for me, um, what saved it, it wasn't so much. The, the the that contextualization and self awareness, but the the fairly wide range of formal innovation that Boulet displays throughout. I mean, it's true that his sensibility remains Boulet exactly the same, but like, you know, um, there's very different art styles, different panel layouts, different kinds of stories, different takes on things. I mean, it all comes from a certain place of a certain you know nerdy humor, um, but. Uh, um, and also, the, uh, for me, some of the standouts um, are a series of um, uh, the silent, silent strips. Silent strips in the mm -hmm. middle, yeah. Um, which uh, I, I find some of the stuff he puts in the word balloons really inventive, and it's just this sort of farcical series of misunderstandings between um, uh, residents in apartments on the same hall. Right, and you know, I, I'm right with you in the innovations and the variety of styles, both storytelling style and even art style that he brings to the various entries we see in this first volume of notes. I mean, I appreciated that as well. Um, but but getting back to something that you mentioned earlier, where he talks about these two syndromes, right? Because you know, the first one he mentions is the Frankenstein syndrome, where you have 
a lot of work on very different parts of something, and then you bring them together, but they don't really fit or look or feel cohesive when you bring them together, kind of like a Frankenstein's monster. But then the other one that we get toward the end, as you mentioned, is called the funny colleague syndrome. And you're right. It was when he was talking about the funny colleague syndrome, and we can find this in the text on pages 184 and 185, and he's describing to his his female friend or significant other, whoever the hell she is, we don't know, um, that – you know, it's it's like this colleague that occasionally you find entertaining, but with <laughs> within a concentrated period of time, can be less than than enjoyable. And he's so I think his awareness that this may not be the most cohesive text for him. Um, I, I do think that that goes a long way f- in, in terms of. Taking in this book, right? Because he's aware of its limitations as well. But he nonetheless decides to publish it. And one of the main reasons why he publishes it is because, as he tells his friend, a lot of people who loved his webcomic originally and who continue to read them keep asking him, when are you going to put it in print? When are you going to come out with a book version? When are you going to get this stuff out so we can actually have it in our hand and keep it with us and maybe more easily access it? And and that's important. So we should make a distinction between – let's say maybe our personal tastes and what he's attempting to do here and, and take him on his own terms, right? What um, what Henry James called uh, in, in The House of Fiction, you, you take an artist on his donee, right? So if, if, if an artist says, this is what I attempt to do, then that's what you judge him by. You don't judge him by things other than what he or she intended. And so coming to Boulay on his own terms, I think this is great. Now, these kind of diary entries – in book form may not be to my taste, but what he attempts to do and his awareness of the limitations of this form going from webcomic to print, I mean, I do appreciate where he's coming from. And so I think in that way, this first volume of Notes is is successful. Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny because I know you've mentioned earlier um, that you really – one of your favorite things, whether in comics or prose, is the interlinked story cycle, right? Um, but like if you have a book of short stories or even essays – let's say in prose do you tend to read it all through and push through as if it were you know like in more or less one sitting or one continued read or do you just kind of leave it on the shelf and dip in every now and then because i think then you could kind of recreate that sort of bloggy reading experience if you got this book but like you're like oh i'll read a couple boulet strips today like you know me i had to read this whole book in you know a fairly short amount of time so I could podcast it. But I don't think that'll be the normal reader experience, right? So, Well, I don't know because he does say toward the very beginning when he's talking with his female friend or, or significant other that, of course, I'm going to put them in chronological order. Why would I do it otherwise? And so that tells me that if he is consciously arranging these – comics that originally appeared on his blog in chronological order, then we there's a reason for that. And you know, if there's a reason for that, then we should read them and experience them in chronological order. So going from beginning to end just made sense to me. Now, a collection of essays is different, but I think anytime you're dealing with a series of stories, whether it's one longer narrative or a collection of individual ones, you know, I do tend to read works of fiction from beginning to end, right? So even if there's a collection of stories, you know, I, I'll start the first and then end with the last unless there's a particular reason for me to read one of the ones in the middle or read something out of order. Oh, it's not the order I was interested in, in so much as in. Like I find that when I read story collections, when I read them through, sometimes I'm disappointed because it's like listening to an album where you realize that, that maybe this this uh, maybe this maybe artist or singer isn't, isn't that very – doesn't have that many tricks up his or her sleeve. Uh, so like if you listen to – I don't know. It's like if you listen to a Tom Petty album, like all the songs start to sound the same. But if I listen, if I listen to two songs, put a, uh, if I read two stories, put the book away, come back uh, a week later, read two more stories, it doesn't have that effect. I mean, I wouldn't read them out of order. I'm just saying that I would like, like I know, like sometimes there's been short story collections where I've read half of it and the and the other one and it stays on my shelf for like six months and I pick it up again and I read like two more. You know, like. I don't know. That's just something that happens to me. It's not a prescription for reading or anything, but but I wonder if that wouldn't sort of mitigate some of the um, effect of uh, jerkiness and sameness that that uh, 
that we uh, have w- here in this yeah, book. W- without messing with chrono- chronology. Because right. sure, I, I also don't think there, you know, I don't think there's anything to be gained from reading this out of order. You know, I mean, but again, that gets back to uh, something that I pointed out earlier, and that is the difference between experiencing this online on a blog, yeah. in essence, a webcomic, and experiencing this in book form, right? Because there's certain expectations, certain, let's say, unspoken, quote unquote, rules of how we're to consume that medium uh, that are different between print and digital media. And I think with blogs, that's something that I, th- I think blogs by the very nature is something that we keep coming back to occasionally. Right, we don't sit in front of our computer waiting for the next installment of a blog, whether it's a comic or or like a written prose piece. Um, we come to it whenever we come to it. You know, sometimes we may get alerts, but uh, it's something that we do occasionally, not all the time. Whereas a book, I think the expectation is more in the direction that we will read it in larger chunks over a shorter period of time. Right, so it's a more concentrated experience. And I think that those different expectations of the reading experience can make a particular comic like we have with Boulez different depending on how you read it. So again, this is something that I think without that frame that we've been discussing, that it could be better experienced, at least for me, online than in book form. But in book form, I really do like how Boulet includes this contemporary contextualizing framing with he and this friend of his that have this conversation about the ins and outs of turning something from online digital to print. Well, here's a question. Um, do you th- – is there – we talked. We briefly mentioned the, the the series of silent strips in the middle, but uh, in roughly the middle. I have to say, one of the things I love, love, love about the uh, the English edition, uh, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but is that they they added page numbers. It's just uh, it's, <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, seriously, like, like I, 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 that helps me so much when I work. So I guess I'm just hyper aware of it. And like, I've done books where. Like there's one book I loved called Billy Fogg, and it was kind of like I, I described it as Edward Gorey meets Calvin and Hobbes. But since it was kind of this you know fake macabre thing, he he numbered every page thirteen, and oh my god, it was and this was before PDFs, right? So like so there wasn't another page numbering system, and it was so excruciating trying to talk about this uh, and, and I'd get on the same page with editors because it would be like you know we. Anyway, so but uh, but um, the, <laughs> we can stop stop. That was a tangent. But um, uh, is there a strip or two or a couple strips that stand out to you? I know it's kind of uh, hard when the, I think the very um, the funny co- uh, colleague syndrome works against that to some degree. But is, do you have ones that uh, stuck out to you that you like a lot? You know, I do like those those silent strips, and one in particular I really enjoyed was it begins on page ninety four, and this is what a maybe about a ten page silent strip that is relatively simple, where you have Boulet asking a neighbor for a corkscrew, and she's getting ready to take a shower. And then he knocks again, and he asks for a bottle opener. And she goes back in. That that story I, I enjoyed, and then what that eventually leads to. Um, I think a better way for me to answer your question is not by saying which ones I appreciated most, but which ones I liked the least. I mean, I'm not trying to be negative here, but 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 here's where I'm going with this. I think that where the book begins, uh, this is another. Those strips had me kind of trying to readjust my expectations of what this was about. When he's talking, uh, when Boulet is writing about specific events and artists and relationships that he has with, let's say, other comics artists and and even people who aren't comics artists, I felt lost. In other words, I felt as if I were coming Uh. in 
to a conversation without knowing what it was that the conversation was about before I got there, right? That's interesting. Or, or that Boulay is having some kind of interactions with friends of his, and I have no idea who these friends are, but they continue their conversation as they walk up and listen to what they have to say. So I felt a little alienated by the first maybe, I don't know, quarter of the strips in this book because – now, to, to his credit, he does – or maybe this was something editorial did – give a few uh, notes about what something is, right? So if, if he mentions a name, we get a little information about who this person was or what they've done. Or, You're talking about the footnotes? Yeah, the footnotes that are at the bottom of, yeah, of various are, panels. There are but no they're footnotes not, in the French edition. Okay, so that's but, a translation um, issue we can talk about. Right, um, but they're not that plentiful. But even with those, I did feel a little bit of an outsider coming into this book, and I, that I didn't like. Now that's very fascinating to me, and that's very, very, very uh, that's very helpful because um, uh, I, I definitely felt less of that because I am more familiar with these names and the French scene. But um, so, like, that's not perspective that I could have had, and, and that's really valuable to me. But I also do think that the interesting thing is that. He grows out of this. Like, right. over the course of the book, there's fewer and fewer stories about that time I went on tour or went to this comics festival and then stayed with my friends in this hotel room and we got up to hijinks in the pool. There's, there's less and less travel, pro, uh, sort of professional uh, inside baseball and travel logs. And there's more and more stuff about the, the, um, the daily life stuff. And I think that's because He's finding his voice as a blog, as a comics blogger. He's finding out what he actually likes to do and is good at. And those those are early things are the most conventional. I mean, they're they've got. I mean, I know France has a number of creators that have become kind of famous for these uh, meditative uh, or um, slash humorous uh, travelogues, like Guy de Lille, um, uh within his various foreign cities. Um, and there's, so there's a lot more of that going on in France in this uh, – a lot of Louis Trondheim's uh, um, Little Nothings comics blog stuff. It's even, even way, way more inside baseball. It's like uh, – or some of even David B.'s diaries can be like that. And there are other people like Jean Menu who have just made it their art form. You know, And it does present something that's very difficult to to translate because – of all the cultural specificity of this world of festivals, this world of trains that are uh, frustrating, uh, this world of French bureaucracy, this world of uh, French creators and comics and their hijinks. Um, uh, but I also do think it's it's like it, it's where he started right. his blog. You know, it's it, it's it's the most conventional, most bloggy, typical form. And and he and later there's there's it gets thinner and thinner on the ground as the book goes on. Right, yeah. And, you know, it wasn't so much the professional references that he makes in terms of festivals or other creators. It were it was more the geographical markers, for instance, what systems of train or buses mm. or, or what have you, that after a while I just – I quit trying to figure it out and kind of read passively, right? Instead of trying to actively uh, determine, okay, so which line is he on here and where does one part go with, with another part of this comic that he mentioned earlier, I just sat back and let it go by me, so to speak. Yeah. No, I, 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 I totally see that. Like I, I, I do think – well, I don't know. I mean, is this a good time to segue to um uh uh I, I What I the mean, translation issues? Sure. Yeah. Because so so here here's the thing. My my main problem with the translation in this book is that it's really not smooth and I don't know where to point that to. I I I, I can uh, it, it's not smooth. In a number of ways. I mean, in, in the main way it's not smooth is that there's not a coherent take or strategy on how we're going to do this book. Um, there's there's all sorts of different things going on stra- translation-wise, and I'll, I'll unpack that. But um, – and I don't uh, – you know, this translation is – is I should say first off, the translation is translated to three people, Boulay, the author himself – who I know has a hand in translating his, or or may even be completely in charge of translating his own blog in the English version, because his translations of his blog in the English version, let's say they're they're entertaining and noticeably non-English, you know, you know, um, 
there, or at least noticeably not English from an English speaker. You know, you always – I think there's a large – there's a much la- larger margin of tolerance for bad English online. I mean the internet is what it is. Uh, and, and by bad hmm, – uh, bad is pejorative. Let's just say English that is – doesn't sound like a modern-day – it doesn't sound natural. It doesn't sound like a modern day native speaker because we know that, you know, I have, let's say, a highly developed, a fairly highly developed ear for English of the late 20th century because it's the English I was raised with. And so, you know, in 20 years, maybe less, people are going to read my translations and be like, man, that that doesn't sound like the English of a modern native speaker. Uh, uh, so, like, we know that it's a moving target, you know, so right. like. When I say things are bad, I don't mean they're bad. I mean they're they're off for some reason. They can be off in time. They can be off in geography. They can be off in any number of things. Okay, but um, this translation is credited to Boulay, Nora Goldberg, and John Anderson. Now, I don't know where Nora Goldberg is now or what she's doing, but she used to work at Titan, and I worked with her as when she was an editor there, and she translated stuff for them too, and um, I have every faith in her ability. Uh, John Anderson is with Soaring Penguin, and I... I don't know much about him, but I know he's a native English speaker, right? So, like, there's no reason for the book to sound as clunky as often as it does. And I think not – and I'm not going to nitpick on these tiny clunkinesses uh, this time so much because I think there's, like, you know, one or two per page where the language could just be cleaned up. And I don't know whose, you know, fault that is. But I think the the, the main drawback of that for this book is that you want things to flow when you're telling a joke, Jokes really have to crack, and this is a book that lives and dies on humor. And when you just have things that are just off, just a little bit off, like people always say arrive instead of show up, or, or like – and sometimes arrive just sounds really weird. Like because it – and I know, sure, from a French speaker that, you know, he's just literally bringing you over uh, arrive, arrive, right? But like you don't have to know that to, as an English speaker to feel, feel that it sounds weird. And not all of these things I think that I claim sound weird or clunky are maybe just below the level of active cognition, but they do have a cumulative psychic effect. They drag down jokes. They drag down timing. They clunk up what should be smoother. Um, And if the dialogue were sparser on the ground, then it wouldn't matter. But this is a really dialogue-heavy book. So that's one thing. Uh, And the other thing is... um, in the beginning, especially, um, maybe you just have – I think there's just less need for it later on. You get a lot of footnotes explaining things. And usually these are – I actually like footnotes. I don't think they interrupt the flow of reading. You may be different, but we, you may have a different opinion. I, I know Derek and I, you and I spoke about this in relation to pretending is lying, You know, like whether things should be footnoted or not. Um, footnotes are pretty thick on the ground in the, in the uh, first half of the book, and um, I think it's helpful, but – I feel like there's two different strategies you can go with. You can go with footnotes or you can go with replacing cultural references, right? Like these can be complementary strategies. They can be – but in this book, sometimes they're at odds, which is that sometimes you get – like the most glaring example for me is is, uh, um, much later in the book, you get someone talking uh, uh, – makes a um, derogatory comment about Trump – Oh, oh yeah, a, that's right. Uh, as a as a uh, as a Trump voter, and it's totally jarring to me because this book is is clearly set from 2004 to 2005. Right. You know, so, like, if you're going to replace that reference, because in the original French it was a reference to a French politician, um, if you're going to replace it, you, you should have replaced it with Bush, right? Because you, you but or, or it's like, are you trying to keep the 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 illusion of the era consistent, or are you just saying, oh no, you know, this is an update. If you're saying that, oh, this this hard copy English book is an update of these blog things, then you could have changed everything and made it up to date. But there are some things that remain in the past and other things that remain up to date. And this is the kind of inconsistency, the the grab bag approach to translation that I get. Like there's another time when someone made a valiant effort to replace a joke. And it's in this – and I I, know, you know, it is eye-opening to someone who does know uh, both languages and has both copies of the book. I have to give them credit for doing a lot of work to replace a lot of jokes. But it's it's a little weird. Like the ideas behind the jokes are weird. Like um, uh, there's a um, 
there's a part where he's talking about going to fix, get his computer fixed, and he's afraid of basically the, the Geek Squad at the French version of Best Buy. <laughs> right. And he, um, and then they start barraging him with technical sounding gobbledygook, and they ask him about the chip, and he goes the sheep, and that doesn't make any sense as a joke unless you know that French people pronounce C H I P chip as sheep. Now it's come something completely different in the French, but like, in, but when they went into the English, they made this weird bilingual joke that has that is tainted with French knowledge that doesn't make sense. You know, like so it's like why why what like I I don't do I think that's wrong or right? No, I mean the thing about translation isn't so much wrong or right as justified and unjustified. But like I want to know what the thinking is behind that. That's a very strange choice. Yeah. Just like the now title, I, the, sorry. The, go ahead. You know, I was going to say about the the chip sheep uh, joke. It, this is something that comes up later, like two or three other times in the text, where the character Boulet will mention something about a computer chip, and you know he's referencing a chip, but he'll say sheep. And I got the joke, and I mean, to me, I saw what they were doing. I I don't know if that's the best choice in terms of going in to an English translation, but I did get the the chip sheep joke. And so it's not as if I felt that this was something that I just couldn't understand or that I felt like an outsider like I did with other elements of the early stories. But uh, you're right in suggesting that maybe a rationale for making that translative move would uh, would help to clear up some of this stuff. Well, no, I mean it's 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 like you know like the old Nietzsche Nietzsche line about the jo- a joke is an epitaph on the death death of a feeling. I feel like sometimes a translation can be an epitaph on the death of a joke in 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 that like what you see instead is a marker that indicates there was a joke there, but you no longer have a funny joke, right? Uh, and 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 that's what um, I mean. I heard, I listened to this podcast. I listened to these podcasts. Sometimes I talk about translation, and one was a, a language podcast that was um, a slate language podcast. I think um, before John McWhorter started hosting, and he's he's a wonderful host. But like they had this one where they w- w- said, "Why is Seinfeld so hard to translate?" And they went on about like Seinfeld just not being a hit in many other countries, and n- no one could figure it out because Americans thought it was so hysterical. And sure, there's a lot of cultural baggage there, but they went into detail on this one German translation of a joke, and. Um, I actually thought the German translation was fairly decent, but the, the, the hosts were just convinced that it wasn't as funny as the original, and they're unpacking all these reasons why. But the main thing is that the German one does, you know, like when, when you're unsuccessful, when you haven't replaced something funny with something funny, then you often get the, a, a kind of a little sign that says, this is supposed to be funny. But, uh, you know, like, so, but also, like, what is the, what is the deal with the title? Right. Um, why is it still born to be a larve? What does larve mean to you in English? Something that is just forming. And I saw where they were going with that because this is also a quote from somewhere in the text. Yeah, 81. His... It's 81. Okay. Uh, I, I got that. And so I, I got I, – I thought that born to be a larve was – you know, the, this is the first volume of something that he's doing. He's developing as he's going along and we're seeing it. In some ways, kind of like right before our very eyes, or at least if you read the original blog, you were. Um, but another thing that I brought to that title, and this may be culturally and language specific, um, phonetically, born to be a larve is very close to born to be alive. And I know that that is a phrase beyond the song the disco song from 1979 i think it was but i can't help but think of that song when i saw that subtitle born to be a larve it sounds like born to be alive and i'm thinking of that song from from the late 70s um but again you don't need to know that song to know born to be alive has some meaning and i thought it was a just a play on words that me not being a translator i, I honestly i didn't give that much thought um but you as a translator, I can see where you do give it more consideration than I would. No, I think you give it – I give it I, – I agree with you absolutely. I think the intent is born to be alive. I think the only the only level of French that you're missing a little is that is that larve is also like um, – or, or our word for larve uh, – larve is in French also like you know um, 
a humorous pejorative word for you know wimp or you know some spineless worm all things that you so we associate with larva uh, in English, see folks. that we makes don't... sense to me. That, I wish I'd known that. I didn't even think about that as a possibility for the meaning of the subtitle. But we don't call people larvas, so like we don't. It, right. We, we we wouldn't. You know the 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 association would not be completely alien to us. But at the same time, the word is not. That's not how the word is used. And so, like, I mean, the only reason I ask this is because I think this is something that I would jump over in the text. But when it's right there on the title, I'm like, oh, that's weird. That's another marker of foreignness for me in a title. And I know titles are hard. Titles are like little haikus. You know, they're really hard to get right. But like, so, and and also don't know, like, I don't know what the, I don't know if like how the translation worked on this. Like, was it that someone gave it one pass? Oh, there was that Boulay did the first pass and then other people just kind of edited it to finesse it into English, but then left the things they thought were okay, you know, like. That's that's a um, like. So you're saying too many cooks in the kitchen phenomena? Well, I don't know. I mean, a lot. Sometimes multiple cooks can really, really help. You know, but I think multiple cooks maybe all have to adopt the same coherent, overarching strategy or, or something. You know, like I mean, like because uh, like there also are like weird things where some of the sound effects uh, are missing uh, from, and there's no particular reason. Like, is it just editorial oversight or like? Um, you know, um, and that's not something you could know without consulting the original. But like, uh, I and I only did that because not only am I obsessed with sound effects, but also sometimes when the sound effects weren't missing, I wanted to know what they originally were, if they'd been changed or not. You know, like, um, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Basically, I feel like there's 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 all sorts of different approaches to how to tackle translation problems in this book, and they're not always on the same page. And that's in addition to the sort of basic clunkiness that I think drags some of the jokes. Right. But, you know, and I'll, but I also, and I, I've been hitting the Boulay's humor pretty hard, but I also do think that he's capable of these moments of um, a startling shift into, into beauty. Uh, and, and the one in my head for that is the part when he real, he, uh, he's having, he's aggravated by fixing his own computer and then, um, his girlfriend slash significant other slash flatmate says, uh, oh, come on. You really like it. You really like, don't give me that. You really love it. And it suddenly cuts to like, uh, almost a, 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 a I want to say it like a watercolor ish type, uh, uh, or, um, really beautiful little illustration of, um, Boulay as a little boy playing with giant Legos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right. and, and there are a number of those moments throughout the book that I think, uh, he's, He's really, um, yeah, yeah, really, really. Uh, there's there's moments of um, real feeling that uh, where the where the where the humor suddenly swerves into to real feeling. Right, and I agree. I agree. Um, and you know the the example that you just referred to, where he's working on his computer and admits that he does like it, and it's like a kid playing with Legos. I mean, that's in like later in the text where we get a series of these entries where you do have a variation of style, and not just in terms of the art, but also in terms of the storytelling. So, uh, I mean, by the time I got to the last half of the book, I think things picked up for me, uh, because, you know, largely because there was this kind of variation in, in style in a variety of different ways. And I, I liked where he was going there. And so to me, that is one way that you would use a web comic or a comics blog um to to play around with different kinds of art and storytelling and you know even colors i mean some of these are in color some are in black and white some that are in color use basic colors some have uh more softer let's say pastel watercolor feel to them and, and, and i think that's one of those stories there but there is a lot of feeling in this I do think, though, getting back to an earlier point that we make, it, that if you're someone who doesn't necessarily like this kind of autobiographical storytelling, and, and this is a particular kind of autobiographical storytelling in that it's in diary form, uh, and, and that's not necessarily the same thing as, let's say, a comic's biography, right? So a diary comic is where you have these little moments in someone's life and them writing about it or drawing it. Just as one would in a diary or journal, right? This is what I did today, dear diary. 
you know, or this is the experience I had, or this is what it was like to try to catch the train, or or what have you. Um, and that's just something that doesn't resonate with me as um, I don't know a genre or even a subgenre. But again, that's more of a matter of taste than uh, a, a critical appreciation of what Boulay is doing. <laughs> But since you did mention the the magic words comics biography, um, that's in fact exactly what uh, our next book is about, right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and segue to the other book we're going to be looking at this month, and this is Penelope Bajou's California Dreamin' Cass Elliot Before the Mamas and the Papas. This came out just recently from First Second. And, you know, I think this may be – is this the first, first, second book you and I have discussed on the Eurocomics show? Yes, Derek. Um, uh, this is the, the, the first, second book uh, – the first, first, second book I think we've covered together, though I know that before I came on uh, to the podcast, you uh, and Andy had covered um, Penelope Bejia's, uh U.S. debut also from first, second, uh, Exquisite Corpse, right? Yeah, yeah, back in May of 2015, and I think it was Andy Wolverton and I discussed oh. that book on episode uh, 135, and I remember both of us really enjoyed the book, especially, let's say, the first – Three quarters of it. Yeah, I think um, there are too many twists at the end there. Yeah, yeah, and and so yeah, the ending kind of worked against what uh, Beju was attempting to do toward the beginning. But but still, uh, I think a really good book, and I think both Andy and I thought at the time that that might be her English language debut. Was Exit Corpse her first English translation? Uh, yes, it w- it was, and uh, um, and I. And uh, yeah, um, and it was it was well received in France too. But I think it was really her blog that got her a lot of momentum after that. And then she also had another uh, book. Uh, she's had uh, quite a number of books, but she had another um, book. I'm blanking on the title right now, but it's um, uh, uh, but it was adapted into two different movies in France. Um, and it's kind of uh, about the you know it's kind of like a Bridget Jones type type thing, um, romantic and professional travails of. Uh, um, um, single uh, a girl who um has a kind of crazy family, a crazy meddlesome family. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the name, but uh, but that's, well, that's not okay. been into English. But I, I do think that uh, Exquisite Corpse is really the um the last book of hers I'd read. I hadn't really kept up with her uh, career, and I have to say, nothing in Exquisite Corpse prepared me for. Uh, California Dreaming, because California Dreaming knocked my socks off. Yeah, now California Dreaming is a comics biography, and it's about, as the subtitle suggests, Mama Cass or Cass Elliot. And this book, in fact, two weekends ago it uh, at MOCA, it won the MOCA Award for Excellence. Yeah, I mean, I th- I, this this is this is a, a a knockout in every way. I I, I think this book. Um, I wish this book every success. I I certainly hope it doesn't need any help because it if this book doesn't make it on its own, I mean like this I think this book has everything for I, I think I don't think uh, and uh you definitely do not have to be a fan of the mamas and the papas to read it, you know, or either. It's just Right. And in it, fact, this is a book about – not about the Mamas and the Papas. As the subtitle suggests, this is Cass Elliot before the Mamas and the Papas. And so by the time we get to the very end of this text, we see that the Mamas and Papas are just about to really take off uh, as the Mamas and the Papas. And and one of the things that Beju does is – I mean uh, first and foremost, she focuses on the character of Cass Elliot, whose real name is Ellen Cohen. Um but in addition to that, she demonstrates that there is not only a history, a past history, to this one figure, Cass Elliot, but also to what we understand now as the Mamas and Papas. Because Cass Elliot was in uh, different groups before the Mamas and the Papas, some of which included 
members of or what would have been at the time future members of the Mamas and the Papas. And so we get that kind of evolution in music history. So I think that if you're someone who's interested in the Mamas and the Papas, this book is definitely for you. If you're interested in music and American music history, especially for the 1960s, then you're really going to appreciate this. But even outside of all of that, I think an appreciation of the kind of person that Cass Elliot was. I mean, that's the big takeaway from this text. Well, yeah, um, I think, okay, it's a 266-page book, right? But it's an incredibly swift read, and not only because the pages are not particularly dense, but also because I think one of the things that makes the book succeed so well on a pacing level is the very coherent narrative strategy that um, Baggio takes of uh, basically sort of doing each chapter from... He, she, almost every chapter is named after a character, a different character, um, uh, someone who pops, uh, another person who pops up in 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 Cass's life, and it's not exactly a POV, I'd say, from that. But 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 the the chapter does uni- unify a bit around the whatever character lends it lends the chapter its name, and I, I think that kind of switching up, um, right, uh, really really powers um the the because i read this book in one sitting and really fast and not because i had to get it done but because it's very absorbing and it's it's um and also like it gives you oddly enough it gives you such a sense of 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 breadth and scope to 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 that that structure like somehow it's a very it felt very literary but in in a very canny way it it felt you know it 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 really because there's as a result there's a lot of gaps you know uh, um of her life that are, are left out, and yet each each chapter is so powerfully structured around a, a, a moment. You know, like, actually, like, I was right. hooked on this book right from the first chapter because, like, the the the, the I, I find the final panels of the first chapter just really the, the prologue or the first chapter, chapter one. Um, um, no, the chap uh, chap chapter one. Okay, uh, chapter because, one. Right, because there's I, I think that. It's easy in any kind of text to overlook a prologue, but I don't think we should overlook this one and for a variety of different reasons. You were talking about the book's construction, and I think it's worth mentioning this in a little more detail here. Basically what we have is 18 chapters proper and then a prologue. So in essence, you have 19 sections of this book, so 19 parts or moments of storytelling. And in various ways, the very last chapter, chapter 18, links back to something that we see referenced in the prologue. Uh, Mm -hmm. And in fact, there is kind of almost an exact overlay in ways uh, regarding dialogue. Yeah. Another thing that's significant is that with the exception of the prologue in chapter 18, as you mentioned, every single section is from some perspective of an individual in her life at that time. Uh, so, for instance, in chapter one, the name uh, the name we get is Lee, and Lee is uh, Ellen or Cass Elliot's sister, and. It, it may not be clear t- until toward the end of that chapter because she's yet to be born, but she's the one who's telling us the story. And so every chapter from 1 to 17, the chapters proper, are from pr- a perspective of an individual, and they bear that individual's name. Now, some of these are, let's say, more point of viewish than others because in some of these chapters – Whoever's name is associated with this chapter, they are the ones who are narrating this, and their narrations are given in these kind of voiceover boxes, right? So they are telling us a story about what happened at this point in Cass Elliot's life. But not every chapter is narrated by the person that it's devoted to. So sometimes a chapter will have an individual's name. We may not have any voice, let's say, outside of the actual action that's taking place in that event in her life. Uh, in, in other words, no narration, but that person is just important in her life for different reasons at that moment. And so we do get different perspectives among these various chapters, except for the prologue and then chapter 18, which are associated with no name. And it's also important to note that because of this structure, because of the storytelling st- style that Beju holds in this book, California Dreaming, at no point do we get – uh, Cass Elliot's story from her own perspective, and I like that. Yeah, no, I I think one of the uh, uh, another effect of these chapters. I, I I don't know if I said this clearly earlier, but like uh, effect of this structure was really 
by virtue of what it left out, it really pulled me in. Um, like, I don't know even exactly what it leaves out in her life. I just know large portions of her. I mean, th- th- there are definitely things being skipped from chapter to chapter, but it really sucks. Um, like, it's almost like being limited in my view of what I see of her life makes it come alive for me. Um, and also being varied in my view of what I see in her life. But like I said, uh, the character work is really, really on point, And that's really what what caught me at the end of the um the first chapter too is that like I feel like the first chapter comes to almost a a short story ending, you know, like it has a sense of projected fate to it, um, right? It, and and it and it's it's you know it, it, it and 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 yet it's also supported by everything that came before. Like it's it's a the character work throughout this book, and I think I mean it, it, it plays fair with with everyone. It plays fair with you know. Uh, with with uh, um, the mem- members of the future, mamas and papas, the other people she meets, her father, it plays very fair with their, their, her mother. Their their human failings and how those human failings, uh, they're both uh, and their the the uh, you know what what what's uh, people's fortes and flaws are are clearly drawn and uh, cannily deployed in a way that makes you see how. Uh, see the profound effect they have on each other's lives, uh, the, right? Uh, through uh, and and yet everyone remains blameless too in this weird way, like blameful and blameless in that very uh, that literary conception of character. You know. Right. Um, now you mentioned the end of that first chapter where Lee is telling us about her experiences, or at least telling us about her older sister, basically in the moments before she was born, and and how that chapter ends, and it, it kind of anticipates things to come. It's not a spoiler to say because this is at the very beginning of the book that it's about uh, Cass Elliot's weight problem, right? Uh, and so this is something that is a late motif that works throughout the text. So every, I mean, the book is not centered on. On her weight, but every now and again, her weight and her attempts at dieting, her unsuccessful attempts at dieting, becomes an important part of her life and an also important part of the lives of others that she interacts with, like the future members of the mom and papas, mamas and the papas. Um, so I, I think that it's it's important to uh, that 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 what Bejou is doing in that first chapter. Another thing you mentioned, though, and I, I like this. It resonates when you say that it's the parts that's left out that really brings this to life. I agree. I couldn't help but think about the ending of Citizen Kane. Now, I'm not saying that this is a Citizen Kane worthy graphic novel, but one of the things, if you remember, at the very end of Citizen Kane, uh, the reporter, I believe his name is Johnson, he's looking for answers. I mean, especially to Rosebud, what makes Kane? who he was, and he thinks that the key is Rosebud. So he interviews a variety of different people, and at the end of the film, if you remember, he will he's saying to people around him, he says, I didn't find my answer, but you know, maybe it's like this puzzle. You have the pieces, and you try to put them all together, but in the end, do you have a complete picture of an individual? And I think that that's what we have going on here in this biography of Cass Elliot. We get little moments of her early life. Again, so... Keep in mind, this uh, this doesn't take us to her death in 1974. It's just to the beginnings of the Mamas and the Papas in 1965. But within that moment of her uh, – within that period of her life, we do get these little, let's say, puzzle pieces. We put them all together. We don't have everything, but that's fine. It's the lack of completion that I think really does create a fuller life in this case. Yeah, and, and, and um, so I mean – no, I mean, I, I do think uh, this is not to impugn Thompson. That's the reporter's name, not Johnson Thompson mm. from Citizen Kane. So before fans of Citizen Kane and Orson Welles start uh, crafting your emails to correct me, uh, <laughs> I corrected myself just now. <laughs> Take that. Um, no, I, I, I think I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've been focusing a lot on, on the structure of this book because I do find it so exceedingly. Um, at once ambitious and yet invisible, um, or relatively invisible, or or at least not insisting on making itself felt. It's not some gimmicky structure, but but um, but uh, like it, it's 
I, I feel like it's rare that I come across a comic that has both those things. And I do, and I'm not trying to, you know, um, I, 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 I get, I, I really, I, I rankle when people, you know, say that comics should learn more from, from prose writing in terms of these things. But, but I do feel like this is essentially a novel borrowed or, 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 a, or literary borrowed structure, but it totally works like gangbusters. But on the other hand, to move to the more comics aspects though, like this is also Lee, page for page. This is, this is, um, an immaculately drawn book. Like I, I, I immaculately drawn design laid out. Like I, I, I really, I, I just like the, in the same way that I felt like there's one or two things that, rub me the wrong way language wise in in boulet on every page on this i feel like there's on every page there's something that just i have to stop and and say like just i would just stop and marvel at it even though i, I you know even though even as the narrative was pu- pu- pulling me through and and there's so many things to talk about with with i mean i when i first when i read exquisite, exquisite corpse i thought her you know her style was kind of poppy and 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 very reader friendly and and pictorially pleasant but i didn't think anything of it but i feel like her style here is you know she's in complete and total mastery of the faces like the faces are incredibly expressive yet incredibly simple like we talk about well we talk about you know the lean declared the clear line tradition um uh you know like uh simplifying things to sort of this iconic level and this is definitely not in that tradition at all however it has that same sort of quality of spareness of like with a few lines she can do a great great deal and she has this really um w- one of the things i marvel at in this book is this balance of what looks like messiness you know like it, first of all it's black and white unlike exquisite corpse but like you know like people's hair um uh sort of penciled in uh bushes or 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 backgrounds or or uh, or uh you know there's a sort of like very, there's a very pleasing sketchy messiness to it, but at the same time, it's balanced by a great deal of exactitude in in people's expressions and also in the layout. Like there are times when there, she's doing the narration instead of dialogue, and panel for panel, each panel looks like a tiny poster. You know, like it's it's not because it's so detailed or because it's you know, um, but because just the spacing and everything is very pleasing. Like one of the another reason I think the book reads really well is because, and pulls you through is because. There really aren't that many panels per page. I would say an average of three to five, and or, or um, well, maybe no, I don't know, like four. No, let's make it four to seven. But like, you know, um, but there's a lot. There's a feeling of a lot of white space uh, to me as when when I flip through the pages, and and that that. But it's like this sort of. It's not really true, but there's a feeling of it, and I think it's it's kind of like almost in my mind. I compared it to how when you have a perfectly typeset book. And the type is just centered on the page, and it makes somehow for a very re- pleasing reading experience uh, at a completely formal level that has nothing to do with content. And I do think she's pulled that off here as well. Is that like, you know, the pages feel airy, they feel light, uh, uh, um, they feel fleet, and 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 I think that that's true of the whole book. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I, there, there's more I could go uh, I could go on with the art, but I just you know. I didn't. I didn't want to like talk for too long there, but in case. Yeah. Were... yeah no, I agree. I, I I do like the the drawing style here. Style here, especially in, in you know you mentioned the the white spaces, um, and I think that there is just enough of that without her relying on that strategy too heavily. Yeah, I do think that you know in addition to the storytelling style, which we talked about earlier, uh, her her art style works well with her subject matter. You know, which is Cass Elliot. Which brings me to another question: Is I'm wondering why Cass Elliot as a subject matter? Um, I, I I just don't know, and I haven't read any interviews with Bajou where she says, you know, I've always been a Mamas and the Papas fan, and Cass Elliot in particular. But I'm wondering, do you know why she may have chosen Cass Elliot oh, as yeah, I, the I subject done, for this I biography? My, uh, I should have done more research on this, but yes, I have read reviews where she talks about how. Um, well, first off, you know, you you shouldn't. Uh, first off, it is true. Like, okay, so and there was this interview I remember where she said something like, "If you're um, a French person of my." generation of a certain economic class you probably just grew up listening to the mamas and papas because your parents had it uh um uh on all the time and i think that's true like uh e- like when i i when i was living in france in the early 2000s 
I was surprised by how many people my age roughly loved the mamas and the papas because I did not I did not think that was true of Americans my age. And um, so I do think that there's a sort of cultural currency to the mamas and papas that is enjoyed there in this sort of like in a sort of belated way that is not enjoyed here. But I also do think she had a personal family connection to it where her parents really did love it. And she rattled off a couple other band names, French and American, that she was that she was, you know, sort of impregnated with uh, as a child um, as well. Uh, or um, or immersed in rather as a child as well. So like um, she did she did love it from uh, and uh, if I had you know sorry I I should have if I'd uh, done my homework and read more interviews I'd be able to supply like a broader context for this. Oh no, I mean but. that that's okay. No no need for apologies. I mean it, it makes sense to me. Again, I don't know exactly why she may have chosen Cass Elliot as her subject, but it makes sense to me. And for this reason, I mean not only does she have an Outstanding, beautiful voice, of course. Um, but if you have seen any footage of Cass Elliot on, I don't know, various talk shows or variety shows. It's all there on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, you, you can find it on YouTube. And she does have an infectious personality. And this is something that is addressed multiple times in the book, that even if people have a problem with her, they can't help but be charmed by her in one form or another because of who she is. I mean, she's tenacious. She is entertaining. She is uh, impish uh, at times. And there's something about her that I think, even if she weren't a good singer, that people would be drawn to. And if you you know do a search on YouTube for Cass Elliot or Mama Cass, and you can see her various appearances on I don't know like the Johnny Cash Show or um, Ed Sullivan, uh, uh, you know the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, all of those. I mean, she does come across as very likable, and it is. A, I mean, she's kind of a, a tragic figure in that she died uh, relatively young in 1974. And no, she did not die by choking on a ham sandwich. Uh, That's one of those urban legends that is still out there. But, um, I mean, yeah, so so someone that vibrant, someone who had that kind of a personality uh, can also become kind of a tragic figure having died so young. And so that's, I think, an additional reason why Bajou would turn to Cass Elliot as a biographical topic. Yeah, you know, uh, know, I actually, um, uh, now that I think about it, it's... (laughs) I mean, I probably learned more about the mamas and pa- I mean, it's true that I, I also wasn't raised in a very pop music friendly environment, uh, no, just in terms of family background. But but at the same, so I came late to a lot of things. But at the same time, I did definitely learn more about the mamas and papas while in France than over here. Like I had no idea that Michelle Phillips was such a femme fatale. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, like I didn't like like that was something I learned in France. Like all the like her making the rounds of Hollywood, um, uh, all the, the 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 guys she managed to snag. Like I really. And I think she's pre- w- presented very well and 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 fairly from multiple angles here um, in this book. Um, uh, even though, like the, I think, um, you know, the main drama slash crisis class conflict between the two uh, the two women is just barely coming to a head at the end um, of of the. Uh, of the book, but um, yeah, but even you know, even then, the clash is not between these two women. I think I th- readers, especially those who aren't familiar with the mamas and the papas and the histories of uh, you know sixties rock, um, may think that that's where that conflict is going to be. Let's no, say fairly right. early in the men, text, right. <laughs> right? But it's between you know Denny Daughtry and and John Phillips, yeah. and you know you talked about Michelle Phillips being represented fairly. I agree that. She's handled very well. Even one chapter is given her perspective on things and her relationship with Cass Elliot. Um, I think that everyone in uh, Cass Elliot's life is handled fairly well, with one exception, and that is John Phillips. And mm. maybe he is actually that way, but he yeah. doesn't come across as very likable. No, he comes across he, as a real dick. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I was going to use other words besides a real dick, but yeah, okay, that that basically sums it up. Um, yeah, you know, and, I wondered about that just knowing from from the very more much more recent uh, – by recent, I mean within the last I don't know, eight or ten years, I guess, revelations about, about – or accusations that have come to light that – I wondered about that because when I first picked up the book, I even wondered if we were going to get there or if there's going to be some hint of that. But I wonder how much of that shadows his characterization as well. I don't know. But it's interesting that of the Mamas and Papas, we only have two remaining members, uh, Michelle and John. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see what their reaction has been to this book. 
Yeah, especially since it largely doesn't involve them. But the limited the limited portrayal of John is very extremely unsympathetic. And also, Michelle Michelle does deny her daughter's allegations, right? About about uh, John being. I mean, that's 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 what I was talking, referring to. John uh, slept with his daughter, isn't? Mackenzie Phillips. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I thought was I thought, that an accusation? Yeah, I thought she came forward and said John sexually uh, molested us and um, uh, sexually abused us and carried on a very long relationship with her. And then that um, uh, I again, okay. yeah. This if is, I had heard if I had heard that in the past, I've just forgotten. Ah, okay. Yeah, no. This is a fairly recent. I mean, recent as in like I like again. I say like within eight or ten years. Whereas uh, like I felt yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt like when it came to light, it was a big thing um, because – mainly because the mamas and papas had not really been talked about for quite some time and all of a sudden this was uh, a thing again. Yeah. Now, you know, talking about the mamas and the papas, again, we should underscore the fact that this is not a biography of the mamas and the papas and we see – the main principles of the mamas and papas, Michelle, Denny, John, and of course Cass Elliot, um, at the dawn, right before they hit it, yeah. right? So, and in fact, by the time we get to the very end of the book, um, John has just been convinced to allow Cass into the band, which he was very resistant to throughout. Now, I, I get the sense that this is the kind of biography that we shouldn't expect a follow-up to. So, for instance, I don't think we're going to get uh, the next volume of uh, the Cass Elliot biography of her time, let's say, with the Mamas and the Papas. At least I hope not because there's something so nice about how this ends. It would be great if uh, Beju's treatment of Cass Elliot is only in the early years and she leaves it at that. Have you heard that this may be part of a longer ongoing project oh yeah no god i hope not too i mean i feel like it, you know like it, I, I mean but here here is another thing though we've talked a lot about how we've 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 talked uh, a lot about how it doesn't it's not the mamas and papas and not the mamas and the papas and you readers maybe i mean listeners may be wondering and so what is it about well it does spend a bunch of time in the greenwich village folk scene that um that uh cast was a part of that she felt mixed about. Yeah, by the and way. the better you know that scene, the more you may appreciate it. Kind of like you know, the the more you know what, the better you know what the characters in the Cohen Brothers inside Llewellyn Davis are are based on. The better you can appreciate that movie as well. I mean, uh, um, and so like the, there's a lot, there's a fair amount of time spent in in that scene. I don't think I don't think it really gives a great. If you're not familiar with that scene, I don't think it gives an amazing view. Like you're not gonna get. Uh, this book is centered around Cass and all centered around a narrative character work, and you're you're not really going to get a sociological or historical portrait of the time. And another thing, another th- reason I think you're not gonna you're you're not if you're looking for that you're not you're maybe barking up the wrong tree in this book is because one thing that Bagia is I, I've said Bagia is great at faces, and uh uh but one thing that she doesn't give a lot of play to for whatever reason is um. I, I, I mean, you can correct me if you're wrong, but this is my feeling as I read the book: is is location and setting like the locate the, the the backdrops in this book? Uh, first, she's a very spare style, so like the cartooning centers around the faces and emotions, and then often you know the background is is a little vaguer. But on top of that, I like physical settings is not a feel I get from this book a whole. And this is not a ding; it may be one of those things where it's like this is not what the book's trying to do. So like, and uh, but but uh, like. I mean, even later when they're on an island in the Caribbean, like I, uh, the Virgin I, Island, yeah, 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 I don't get, uh, I don't get much sense of this is what New York was like, and it's true that there's also like not many, not that many establishing shots. You know, there's a lot of interiors, but there's not, there's there's not a lot of like you know conventional out, outside, you know, uh, these buildings, these brownstones, these, you know, so there, uh, there, there's more like oh these sofas, so like. The the sense of locale for me is a little mm, blurrier in this in this read. Um, I don't. I, I get a really strong sense of the characters. I don't really get as strong a sense of 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 um, historical uh, history and locale, with some notable exceptions. Like one of the ones that one of the the, the most the most the most notable one is 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 from mid book when. Uh, people are watching uh, Kennedy get assassinated, um, and like it's a scene that's been played out 
almost in the exact same way in many movies, The Wanderers comes to mind. Uh, um, but uh, but uh, I think that's what it's called, right? But, but it, all these people stand, uh, stopping in the middle of the street, uh, staring at uh, through uh, uh, a store display window at the TVs, all of which are playing what will become the Zapruder footage, right? I mean, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. For for me, this whole question that, that you just raised of setting, right, of a sense of place, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. I really don't think that that's where Bajou w- was going. In other words, I don't think that that's her forte, and she didn't really play it up. Uh, outside of the cover, and I say the cover because on the back of the book we do get a reference to you know Greenwich Village and the Cafe Wa. Um, but the only other place in the book where setting becomes much more noticeable than in other places is in that final chapter when they're in California. Right, and and I think that in that last chapter, that's ne- that's needed in terms of ending the book and taking us. Out on the you know the cusp of the mamas and the papas success, so and of course that takes place in, you know when they're in California, so I think it's necessary there. But for me in in reading this, I agree with you in terms of the lack of a place, a sense of place. But I wasn't necessarily looking for that in this book because of the personality of Cass Elliot is so dominant that that in essence is the geography of this book is her personality. No, I agree. I agree. I, I don't. It's not something I miss. It's something that only strikes me afterwards. You know, like it's not something that. And I do think you're right. I do think there's a lot more sort of <clears throat> the sort of the emptiness of the opulence they've achieved in California is reflected both in the interiors and exteriors that she uses there. So, like, uh, it may be uh, uh, even more cannier than I'm able to appreciate on a first read. Her deployment of 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 landscape and setting. I mean, there are a couple of wide shots of New York, but like. But like I said, I, I do feel like I kind of float through a lot of geography and then – but you're right. The, the, the final chapter does really nail that down. Um, and, and also like the, the content – the focus on the faces. Like I would also say that a lot of times there's – it's a very cartooned book. It's not – there's not well, that's Bajou's style. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's absolutely, absolutely. It's not a book that attempts to like one of the things that one of the things I like she does it with the faces is that often she has these panels where she mushes them together. Almost, I don't mean into one face or some kind of weird cubist blur. I mean, what I mean is like she'll have one, uh, two faces, or sometimes even four or five, and they'll be shown from different angles, but they'll all be really close together. And there's something almost. Um, Iconic or mosaic about the 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 skill the skillful way she does that, uh, and it, it it perspective is a little off. You know, perspective gets mushed the way that like, you know, but but it's very um, it's striking and memorable in um, uh, and and it really cements the emotion in a, in a mm-hmm. moment, and she does it. You know, there there are many times when I felt like like my my eye was drawn to a particular panel for that reason. Mm-hmm. So, Edward, we looked at uh, two new books on this month's Eurocomic episode. We started off with. Uh, Boulet's Notes, Volume 1, Born to be a Larve. And then we wrapped up with a discussion of Penelope Bajou's latest in English, California Dreamin', Cass Elliot Before the Mamas and the Papas. So good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And as Edward pointed out at the top of the show, you can find great books by these creators at the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. And in fact, if you check them out right now, you will find uh, Beju's California Dreamin' and Exquisite Corpse, both at 30% off the cover price. You can also find uh, Tipping Point, which Boulet is one of the contributors to. Also at 30% off the cover price. So definitely check out those prices at dcbservice.com. 
And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about this month's episode. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can contact us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or be like the creators uh, we've gotten in touch with so far and uh, shoot us an email at guys at comicsalternative.com or write me at edward at comicsalternative.com. And you can contact me directly at derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media like Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to the website, which is comicsalternative.com and we do like to hear from you yeah absolutely send us mail that's right send us mail tell us what you think and make recommendations until next month I'm Derek I'm Edward it's been great thanks a lot